Uh, so this is, they're requesting an emergency stay to prohibit Amos Miller from distributing any food outside this to anywhere in the world. Right now, he's only enjoined from selling raw milk products inside Pennsylvania to Pennsylvania customers. They want to expand that globally. They basically want to shut him down. You know, most of Amos Miller's customers come to him for the various raw milk products. So even though he has other products, if they shut down the raw milk, he'd lose most of his business and the farm would be at risk of uh, foreclosure uh, by the time an appeal is fully heard and adjudicated. And so the that what's supposed to happen in the legal analysis that courts are doing when they're looking at a temporary injunction or a preliminary injunction is they're supposed to say, okay, uh, which side do we think will win? How strong is that, number one? But then they're supposed to assess what if we're wrong about who wins? So and what they do is, okay, if I grant the injunction and it turns out I shouldn't have, how do the harms fall out? And you look at, is there injury that's irreparable, that you can't compensate for later? Is there substantial harm to other interested parties that are impacted by the order? And what is the public interest? And they loosely, colloquially call this in the law, the balance of the equities. The What was always striking here was that the state never recognized that balance of the equities. So their entire argument was that they were right on the law and that that should resolve it entirely. When the entire point of preliminary injunctions is to assess what if we're wrong on the law because there hasn't been full briefing, there hasn't been a trial. And the so we don't know what the facts are going to be and we don't know if we fully vet the law or where we're going to end up on. So you're being asked to make a rushed decision without the process that we have confidence in in procuring the most uh, thought through outcome. And the uh, it's part of that process. You look at, okay, if we should have granted the injunction but didn't, look at those balance of the equities. What irreparable injury in this case comes to the state if it turns out we should have granted the injunction? What substantial harm is there to other interested parties if we should have granted it? Uh, what will, How will the public interest be impacted if we should have granted it? And you put that on one side. And on the other side you put in, what if we grant it and we shouldn't have? What's the irreparable injury that we've caused by prematurely and incorrectly granting the injunction? What's the Is there any substantial harm to other interested parties because of us granting the injunction? And is the public interest adversely impacted by us granting the injunction? And you compare those two. Because it short circuits the process of the adversarial adjudicative process of discovery and trial and full briefing, the assumption is to not issue an injunction. And that, that's the trial court analysis. At the appellate level analysis, they're doing a dual level analysis. They're looking at uh, whether or not the, the trial court had any reasonable basis, because there's it's a highly deferential standard to the trial court, that they're not going to second guess the trial court unless he had no reasonable basis at all for his decision. And essentially, the analysis, Pennsylvania, and this is, an, is comparable across the country, is if any of those, what they call the four factors, don't fit, uh, then you're not supposed to grant the injunction. Now here, there's a dual level analysis because they're requesting an emergency stay before we've even briefed the full appeal. So it's, you know, premature decision on the appeal to support a premature decision at the trial court level. The, uh, so it's, it's, the, the, stand, the burden is supposed to be very high for someone seeking an emergency stay, and they're supposed to show there's real irreparable injury and it's all on our side, uh, that there's real substantial harm to interested parties and it's all on our side, that this public interest is all on our side and that the legal merits is compelling. The A, a good ju a judge will approach these kind of requests by not focusing first and foremost on the legal merits, 
they'll focus on, well, what if we're wrong, the risk of being wrong, uh, then uh, well, how do we weigh the irreparable injury? How do we weigh the balance of the equities and substantial harm to other interested parties? How do we weigh uh, the public interest? And the, uh, uh, it, the only argument the state has made all the way through is state says they're right on the law, so that equals irreparable injury. They're right on the law, so that equals substantial harm. They're right on the law, so that equals the public interest. And because they're right on the law, there's no harm to Amos Miller. Because there's, they're right on the law, there's no harm to other interested parties. Because they're right on the law, there's no public interest against them. Which is completely confusing the actual legal standard. Because all of those provisions are about, what if the decision is wrong? What if the state is wrong on the law? You assume that in weighing the equities. You don't assume one party is right and thereby obliterate the other three standards. In fact, what they're trying to do is completely reverse the correct analysis for preliminary injunctions, and in this case, a preliminary stay pending appeal of the order of the preliminary injunction. The court, uh, to its credit, uh, you know, the Commonwealth Court is a, a mixture of judges from a mixture of backgrounds. Uh, there were certain judges, if we got, it would have been real uphill, just because some of the judges on the Commonwealth Court are extraordinarily deferential to the state, even though they're supposed to be supervising and scrutinizing the state. Then there are other judges that are much more conscientious and uh, take their duties much more seriously and sought out the position because of the legal, uh, because they're intellectually curious uh, about the law and want to make the best judgments and decisions as to the law. Uh, we got a good judge in that regard. We didn't get one of the bad judges. So that was promising at the outset because she asked the first correct question to the state. And ended up being, by the way, uh, over an hour long. So it was a very uh, uh, longer than normal uh, oral argument. Most oral arguments are no more than 30 minutes, sometimes 20 minutes between both parties. And uh, it, she went much longer than that. Uh, one a general proxy is years ago they did a sociological study. Uh, and this was the utility of Wisconsin Law School, uh, like the Frank Turkheimer uh, uh, example. They're really good at what was called the Wisconsin method. And the Wisconsin method was, we're not going to just teach you the black letter law. We're going to teach you the policies that create that law, that animate that law, that rationalize and justify that law. And we're going to talk about the social the social consequences and public impact of these laws. So we're going to do a real world analysis of how the system really operates and a theoretical conceptual understanding of how it's supposed to operate to explain the meaning, purpose and intent and impact, impact and effect of black letter law. And as part of their sociological component, one of the things you, you they had Mark Gallanter was one of the lead uh, lawyers and one lead legal professors in that field. That one of the things you study is because uh, I've done a lot of appellate work over the years. Is uh, is there a way to uh, anticipate uh, a probable direction by the the questions that are asked? One of the mistaken uh, misapprehensions uh, of appellate lawyers is they think it's better if they get asked a lot of questions. It's not. The lawyer who gets the most questions loses 85% of the time. That's where the sociological information is helpful. Then you can figure out the reasoning for it is because judges generally come into any case, any matter, with a proclivity one direction or the other, and they tend to ask the most questions of the party that they don't anticipate ruling in favor of. If they're anticipating ruling in favor of you, they don't have as many questions. Their questions are much more, in fact, sometimes they're what's colloquially called softball questions, leading questions that enhance your argument and try to enhance your argument for you. Uh, you'll often see this even at the Supreme Court, where the justices will be arguing with each other by the kind of questions they're asking the counsel. The, uh, and so uh, once you understand that, then that helps you be able to read the room. 
And so if I get, if I'm in front of a court and I'm getting a lot of, a lot more questions than the other side, then, uh, then, then I know, okay, I, I probably got to throw a Hail Mary here and try to find a way to discharge them from their assumptions against my client's position. The, if I'm not getting as many questions, uh, then I hammer home our best, uh, arguments, rhetorical and public policy and practical, you know, borrowing from that Wisconsin law school experience, education, of making sure to articulate the policy reasons why the law needs to be the way we're arguing it, and the real-world impact of the why it is we need the law uh, on our side to be interpreted and adjudicated on our side in any individual case. So the court started out by asking the state, uh, you know, let's, you know, rather than focus on the merits, let's first talk about irreparable injury. Let's talk about uh, the balance of the equities. Let's talk about substantial harm. Let's talk about uh, public interest. And the court later made the point that typically in these cases that they don't actually reach the merits at this preliminary stage uh, unless they are persuaded that the balance of the equities is strongly in the favor of the party seeking this uh, emergency injunctive relief unless they are compelling and convincing on the question of irreparable injury, on substantial harm, and on uh, the uh, bubble of public interest, then they don't even reach the merits. They say, you didn't meet your burden there. So let's move on to the full appeal rather than prejudge the appeal with an emergency state. The state all the way through has not had an argument for how would they suffer irreparable injury if in fact uh, the an injunction is not now granted. Their only argument is we're right on the law and a violation of the law is irreparable injury. Okay, that's why you can get an injunction in the first place, but it's not independent ground separate from the merits, which is the analysis that's supposed to be conducted. And then they've pretended all the way through that there's somehow no irreparable injury to Amos Miller. And again, their argument just begs itself because they say, well, if we're right on the merits, there's no injury from doing something illegal. Well, that just begs the question the, uh, and ignores the real injury if in fact, because again, the analysis is let's assume we're wrong and we shouldn't have granted the injunction. Is there irreparable injury? Not let's assume we're right and then is there irreparable injury, which is what the state kept doing at the trial court and the appellate court level. And it's because the state that can't identify any irreparable injury. That's why. And where, and they were pretending there was no irreparable injury if, in fact, an injunction should never have issued and it were mistakenly granted. Because as the court recognized in the cases that we had cited, uh, losing a family farm for someone who that's integrated into their religious lifestyle is the definition of irreparable injury and has been found as such by other courts. What's interesting is you learn which phraseology sticks with people by how courts question and ask questions. And one of the things I've been hammering away at is this is a fifth generation Amish farmer for whom his farm is part of his religion. That's precisely how the court framed the question to the state. Isn't that irreparable injury? They didn't have any answer beyond, well, if we're right on the law, there isn't. Okay, but if you're wrong on the law, there is. And that's the relevant legal analysis. The second aspect is they pretended there was no harm to any other interested parties. Once again, saying there's no harm if what you're doing is illegal. But if it turns out what you were doing was legal and the injunction never should have been issued, then there is substantial harm. Here, not only to a family farmer, but to all the customers who testified, over hundred, hundreds of them testified, many of them traveled right to court to testify in person, uh, that they would suffer severe harm to their health, to the health of their loved ones, the health of their children, and in ways that's real and dramatic and tangible and can't be remedied by mere monetary compensation. That is the definition of substantial harm to other interested parties. The law in Pennsylvania is you're not supposed to issue an injunction if there will be substantial harm to other interested parties by issuing it, unless there's more substantial harm by not issuing it. And once again, the state doesn't have any substantial harm other than begging the question about illegality and whether they're right on the merits, what harm is the state? 
There isn't any that they could identify beyond that. And then as to the public interest, the court asked a very good question, said, why is there a public interest in the well-being of people who do not live in the state of Pennsylvania and who are not customers of the state of Pennsylvania? Why does Pennsylvania have a public interest in the state and citizens of other states? And is there any case that supports that? The only case they could talk about is a U.S. Supreme Court case interpreting federal law, <laughs> which was inapplicable and an opposite. There was no claim there. They, they didn't cite a federal case for saying we have an interest in foreign citizens. No such claim. So the uh, they ultimately couldn't meet their burden on those provisions. And they came back with, well, Judge, we want to say everything's about the merits. And you can't do those second, third, or fourth prongs without looking at the merits. That was ultimately what they came down on. The analogy they gave um, was that this would be like a unlicensed lawyer, uh, unlicensed indiv an individual practicing law without a license, who says, you, you can't stop me from doing this because it will hurt my, uh, my uh, bank account. The problem with that, of course, uh, we had a good response to that when it was our turn to respond. They got, state got, I don't know, maybe eight, nine, ten questions, something like that. We only, uh, she only asked one question of, of me. The uh, allowed me to present all the way through, and the I made the point, and this was the one she had the question for. It said this is not like a situation of someone who is clearly practicing law without a license. This is like someone who the state is accusing of practicing law without a license, but their defense is they're not practicing law. What they're doing is not within the practice of law. This happened. This issue pops up now and then, of course, in various courts in various states. And I said that the issue is whether a permission permit is, and she actually articulated it very well in her question. So what you're saying is the issue isn't whether he should be allowed to practice without a permit. You're saying there is no permit required for exporting food to outside the state of Pennsylvania. And that's precisely the case. This isn't a case of him doing anything illegal at all. This is the case of a dispute about what the law requires. They say the law requires a permit to merely possess food for the distribution of that food anywhere outside the state, which, as we pointed out, creates an absurd consequence. That absurd consequence being that truck drivers and trains operating and other delivery operators transporting food from New Jersey to Ohio across Pennsylvania's roads and highways and, and uh, railroads are now all criminals because that food is not permitted, is not doesn't have Pennsylvania permit attached to it. But they do possess food inside the state borders with the intention of selling it to people outside the state. And what they want to do is redefine the law that talks about the, they want to take the sale definition and expand the whole scope of the law. What the law says is if you have the, they define what selling is and then, you know, possession, delivery, exchange, etc. But they want to take out the without, within the Commonwealth provision. And they want to redefine it to say, if you possess food within the Commonwealth, then with the intent to sale outside the Commonwealth is applicable. Out to sale, out, in, sale anywhere. The problem is that isn't what the law says. What the law says is possession with intent to sale within the Commonwealth. It doesn't say possession within the Commonwealth with intent to sale outside the Commonwealth. They want to rewrite the law. And, of course, there are critical constitutional reasons, the, uh, including uh, the Interstate Commerce Clause, Supremacy Clause, uh, involving whether there's federal preemption in this particular space, given the scale and scope of FDA activities in, this, in governing interstate sales of milk in particular, uh, the, uh, as well as the uh, Privileges and Immunities Clause, and the Due Process Clause, whether you have a substantive due process right to of a farmer and a consumer to buy food directly from that farmer and the farmer to sell that food directly to the consumer. The it, She was most interested in the interstate commerce clause component and we're able to point out that, you know, there's no, there's, they, Pennsylvania failed to find a single case anywhere in the country in the last century that has claimed that a state can govern exports. All their cases concern imports. They cited the Supreme Court case, the pig case that we talked about 
uh, on the Viva Barnes Sunday show. The, but that, of course, involved California's right to regulate imports. Even though they're regulating the conduct of food of farmers in Iowa, Supreme Court said that's okay because you're only regulating your consumer market in California. You're not regulating it globally. But all that involves imports. In other words, who are you protecting? What's the policy purpose behind these laws? What's interesting is she highlighted a provision, a statute that we had cited, which was the reciprocal agreements clause in the legislation. And what the, the reason why it was relevant was twofold. One, the under the reciprocal agreements clause, it specifically says what the purpose of all these laws are. And the Pennsylvania legislature says the purpose of these laws is to protect Pennsylvania customers and Pennsylvania co consumers, the Pennsylvania consumer market which means it's not about governing production of food. It's not about governing possession of food. It's not about protecting consumers globally. It's about only protecting Pennsylvania consumers. And what they said was to the degree there's a need for reciprocity between states, that maybe the food's being produced in New Jersey, but being imported here, we can do reciprocal, we authorize the government to do reciprocal agreements to enforce our laws there and their laws here. The, uh, of course, there are no applicable reciprocal agreements as applied here, but she was able to highlight that right away. And one of the other key, the whole panic argument that Pennsylvania was trying to make, they literally predicted there'd be anarchy and chaos uh, if the court did not grant the injunction, was the argument that this means all the farmers in Pennsylvania can now sell outside the state. It'll be a complete disaster. And it'll be all this dangerous food everywhere without any controls. And what she highlighted is the argument we have repeatedly made, but it was good to see that she was on top of it from the inception, which is there's plenty of other state agencies. Right? The Ohio Department of Agriculture can take care of Ohio customers, as every other Department of Agriculture in every other state can do, not to mention the FDA, which anytime food crosses state lines, they have a jurisdiction and authority over. So... Uh, and recognizing that was also a critical point because their only scary dynamic of, hey, if you don't grant this, there's going to be disaster and chaos and anarchy is easily answered by, no, there isn't. All these other states have the complete ability to enforce their laws. And it highlighted for me, as the discussion was ongoing, an, uh, an issue that became even more crystal clear for me which is what the law is really about, what Pennsylvania is trying to do here, is they don't agree with the laws of other states. Other states make yogurt, butter, kefir, colostrum, these products completely legal, even if made with unpasteurized milk. The state of Pens the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture has decided not to allow any legality of those products ever, permit or, or not. And... But really, this is about Pennsylvania trying to impose its will on other states and take away the privileges and immunities of citizens of those states from the protection of their laws. The, uh, the additional component that correlates to this was the state made the claim that the reason why colostrum and butter and yogurt is banned is because they're inherently unsafe, which is ludicrous. The, it will enhance our chevron applicable argument in our substantive appeal to the commonwealth court because the state of pennsylvania the legislature has never said any of those products are unsafe they've never banned any of those products from being made in their state they've never banned those products from being sold in their state what happened was for 200 plus years people have been buying those products in pennsylvania from people like amos miller and his parents and grandparents and great-grandparents before them and in 2005, the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture decided to start harassing raw milk makers. And the legislature responded by requiring them to permit raw milk makers rather than continue keep harassing them. And the law just said, focused on raw milk, the, the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture decided to interpret that as well, anything not specifically authorized for a permit is hereby prohibited. That's a major questions doctrine, which raises issues under the Chevron applicable analysis to the Pennsylvania constitutional separation of powers. The end of note, the Pennsylvania, even the regulatory bodies, 
have never made any finding that any of those food products are unsafe. No court has ever found them to be unsafe. They've just decided unilaterally by executive fiat to do something the law never authorized them to do without the requisite factual findings to support it. And it's rebutted by the decision of many other states and jurisdictions across the country and the world. And it's rebutted by our history. For 200 plus years, this was safe. Now, magically, it's unsafe because it's made with unpasteurized milk, even though that's, in fact, the way we've been consuming butter, yogurt, and other items, including milk itself, for 200 plus years. Seems a little incredulous. So the uh, by the end of the hearing, uh, I felt good that uh, we have a very good chance of prevailing at this stage. Not a guarantee, because you never know. Uh, if you've been around courts long enough, you know, you never know. There's always some surprises that come along, favorable and unfavorable, as the nature of the animal is. But the at the last thing the court said was it's a rare case where, uh, in her opinion, both sides are wearing a white hat. So you're never going to get a judge to say the government's not wearing a white hat. That just doesn't happen. But it is uncommon uh, that when you're up against the government, to hear a court recognize the importance of the constitutional and other issues uh, that you're raising, and rather than uh, look at you dismissively. So all of that was pretty promising. So all of the effort and time spent in preparation appears to have paid off, and uh, we'll see how it ultimately turns out.